Now, a lot of you are planting brassicas this year, and uh, you know, even planting brassicas can be a little bit controversial because there's people out there who say, I'd never plant that stuff, the deer don't touch it. And then there's other people on the other side of the spectrum where they eat it down to the dirt before hunting season. What I like about brassica is it's, it's not tolerant to a lot of browsing pressure, but it's decent. Compared to soybeans, for example, you need to plant several times more acres of soybeans in the same spot if your brassicas are lasting. Let's say you have an acre of brassicas, two acre of brassica plantings, then um, you probably need three acres of beans, four acres of beans to make it through. Um, and so you look at it that, you know, browse tolerance are pretty decent. And, you know, just in general, you know, old wives tale, we've known this for 20 years um, or more. We talked about, um, you know, it used to be the old wives' tales that brassica needed frost, like rape, turnip, radish, needed frost on it to make it sweet for the deer to eat it. Well, we've known that by experience for decades. Finally, the QDMA came out with or NDA a couple years ago or a year ago that, yeah, that doesn't do anything to the brassica plant, you know, scientifically. Something we've known, you know, for 20 years, but science is finally catching up to that. And the bottom line is, you know, we've seen where you plant in an area too early, like June, and it's gone by July because there's nothing else green in the area. And then I've seen it rot in the spring. There's a lot of times it has to do with timing. That's why we always like diversity on each food plot, meaning we'll, we'll have some greens that are more candy greens of peas, light oats, maybe late planted buckwheat, light tillage radish, something that draws these deer in early, like a candy crop, and then it's natural for them to step over and start eating the brassica. If you have a brassica planting off to the side somewhere and you say, well, I'm gonna provide this winter food, it's gonna be a great December food source. Well, if they've already established their fall pattern somewhere else on your land or in the, in the neighborhood, why would you expect them to all of a sudden just shift their entire fall pattern that's based on hunting pressure, security, food, and come over to your brassica blend? And that's where you see a lot of that rotting in the spring because that pattern use was not established early, early with a candy crop. You can always move the timing of that. It has nothing to do with the frost. You can move the timing of the brassica. So in a given area, if the, even if you're next to a candy crop in the same food plot, which is what we do, side by side, not mixed together, if the deer aren't touching the brassica until December, we'll add 25 pounds of beans, 50 pounds of peas or both to that brassica mix. It sweetens the plot. So then the deer hit that brassica early. You can move the timing up of when they hit it. Ideally, you'd see about the end of October, early November. That's the perfect timing for brassica, not December because you're starting to get past the deer season. And the whole name of the game with food plotting, of course, you want to have good hunting season. You want to provide them nutrition before the winter time and uh, really build fat reserves and get them into high energy levels going into the winter time instead of trying to you know, focus on depleting energy reserves during the middle of the winter time. But at the same time, you want to protect bucks. You want to control the makeup of the herd. And you can do that on a very small parcel, 40 acres, where you're looking at, I want to hold these deer, hold the attention during the daylight hours, and then send them on to the wintertime safe. And you can do that. So if you're, if whatever food plot you're planting doesn't work till December or January, you just wasted those acres to your herd building, hunting, and often your habitat goals on the property and what you're spending your resources of time and money for. So you can always control the timing when brassicas are eaten. That's a lot. That's something a lot of people don't realize. I've been trying to teach that for 20 years, but it's something that you can do. And uh, and again, just they're not waiting for the frost to sweeten up. So I'm going to go through. Some things of brassica, you know, they're a great plant because it produces a lot of tonnage, several tons of food or a few tons of food in a 10 week period. That's what people like them. You know, clover takes the same amount of time. It takes five months to equal that same amount of volume of food and the deer are eating it all along. So you never take that same amount of volume into the fall, say for clover. We like clover in our small hunting plots, pass-through plots. When you get down to Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana, Arkansas, clover might be longer lasting because there's later frosts and, and warmer uh, falls. So there's a lot of that going on when it comes to clover. With brassica, you're trying to produce a lot of volume in a short period of time so that you can really peak into that late October, November time for your property. So I want to go through, you know, it's a great product. It's a great crop. When I see, again, people saying, well, they won't eat it. Well, there's several reasons. You know, again, you're not establishing the use of the um, plot early. Um, it's with other sweeteners or they're eating it too late. You're expecting them to come over to the single plot and uh, it's out of the way. It's not a part of their fall patterns. And then they're rotting in the spring. A lot of times I see in big ag country where there's low deer numbers, a sign that they won't eat your brassica is often a sign that you should be raising your deer numbers, that you're below average, below carrying capacity for the land. So that's another thing too. You see out there this deer herds that are too low in some open ag coverless regions and, uh, and you need more deer. That's a good sign. 
Hey, thanks for watching the video and we'll be right back. But this is very important, this very important announcement. We have our Camp Kicking Bear event. We have it on Father's Day. It's more of a habitat day. We're gonna see a feature of habitat improvements, how they will all relate to a bedding area, a water hole, food plot, bedding point, morning stands, evening stands, and then we get to take a tour around the majority of the property too. Bottom line is $350 per person times 50 people. We highly encourage you to bring your kids. After all, it's Father's Day. 50, those 50 spots always sell out very fast. On that same day, it's from 10 o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. We have speaking events. All my sponsors kick in for that. So we'll literally be giving away a Matthews boat, a ghillie blind. And so one person will win each of those. For about 13, 14 people will win really good prizes. I could list them all, but check it out. We also have our $100 times 100 hunt raffle to a lucky hunter that'll come hunt with us the end of September for three nights. So really check out all that information. Look at the link in the description. You can ask Jesse, she'll help you out with any scheduling of that and uh, look forward to seeing you guys there. It's a great event. Every dime that's earned goes directly to Camp Kicking Bear and even a little extra on top of that. So. Look forward to seeing you there. So let's go through these as far as what I see when it comes up to a good brassica blend. I've been using brassica since late 90s, coming up with my own mixes since then, mixing it with clover since that time. And it, at least to establish clover. One of the things you want to avoid is a blend that's focused on too early or too late. If you have a lot of green glow, purple top turnips, and it's a high percentage of your brassica mix, you say, well, it's great for that late season. But again, if you're focusing on December, you already missed the boat. It's always good to have a small percentage, whether it's 10, 15, 20% of that brassica blend, like we do with a couple different uh, varieties, purple top and green glow, to focus on that December time. But it should never be 30 of, of your mix or 40% of your mix. And I think that's a theme with all the blends and in Braska, you don't want to be focusing, putting all your eggs in one basket, either early or late. For example, tillage radish. We actually cut our percentage of tillage radish going into this season. We always change those, change those mixes every year because tillage radish is more of an early season crop. The radishes, they like to consume early, the greens. Those greens die later, December, January. So look at that life of the radish is more September, October, November, not November, December, January, February, if you look at it that way. So that's that balance. You don't want too much tillage radish. You don't want too much purple top green globe or other globe varieties that are slanted towards later. You look for that balance. It doesn't matter if it's tillage radish or if it's your purple top green globe mix or forage rapes, forage turnips, meaning instead of putting all the energy into producing a big bulb, they'll often call it seven top turnip where you actually have seven shoots and you're producing more tonnage and green leaf. And so that green leafage, you don't want too much green leafage without the bulbs. It's hoping you see kind of a balance with all those. One of the things that People will put into a brassica blend, which is bad. So really look at your label, read your labels. Of course, if there's high inert matter, but most of the time in brassica seeds, there's not a high inert matter. They're doing that when they're mixing clovers, brassica, cereal grains, and other products. That inert matter gets up high, where we see that some, as high as 50, 60%, where in a bag of seed, you're only getting 50% seed because there's so much other garbage in there. So you always gotta look at that. Most of the brassica blends don't fall into that category. So that might not be something you really need to worry about, but sugar beets. You see sugar beets, you think, wow, I've heard people talk about that. That's a great product. The problem is sugar beets need to grow for about a month longer than the typical brassica mix, almost all of them. And the deer will eat those out and pick those out early, often before the hunting season even begins. So it sounds good. Deer do like them, but they like them so much and they need to be planted longer that they don't give you appreciable value during the hunting season. And a lot of times, they're not even there during the hunting season. So you can't have that herd building opportunity with that seed. And again, looking at that balance, you don't want your brassica eaten down in August, September, just like you don't want it still standing uneaten in December and they're not eating it until January. You have that balance, that perfect timing again is October, November, especially late October, November, early December. That'd be the sweet spot right there where it helps you actually be that herd influencer and where you can control. So those sugar beets a lot of times are put on the bag just to attract your dollars. Hope that makes sense. A lot of things in the seed company, the seed industry are, are that way. That's what we avoid with our seed company, but we wanna have a good quality product. And I don't feel like we need to use, you know, have used car salesmanship tactics to try to get your seed. And we, we don't do that. 
One of the things that I see, and um, this is, uh, you're seeing some clips, it was, this was on an Ohio property, and this is a, a big blend that has a lot of different seeds in it that they probably, by estimation, they probably have 50% of their brassica crop still standing, and that was early May. It's a really bad thing. That means a lot of these collards, kale, canola, we've known that deer don't like to eat those for 20 years. But when a seed company puts that in the mix, you get four feet, four foot of growth. You look at the food plot and say, wow, this is the best food plot I've ever had. There's so much volume, but it's not the best when half of it's wasted because it's still there in the spring. So collards, kale, canola, all designed again to suck your money and make you think, wow, I did a great job. They're four feet tall, but then they don't eat them. You see some of those stalks in that field were half inch in diameter. They're taking up lots of nutrients. So not only are the deer not eating it, but they're taking up an explosion of nutrients out of the soil that's not being returned to the soil. And that's a very bad thing because they're just rotting in the spring, taken from your soil, and they're not being eaten by deer. Going back to that timing thing. Now, if half your brassica crop is wasted because you have poor seeds in there, uh, that's a really bad thing. Now I can say there's always an exception to the rule, but when you get canola, kale, collard greens, imagine that growth in a northern setting where deer, there's not a lot of deer, and they'll eat just about anything that's green. So you might find that they ravish those in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, northern Michigan, upstate New York, northern Pennsylvania, even some big hill country of Kentucky where it's just all wooded and there's no other green around. Then you might find they destroy those things. And the problem is then is you better have a lot of acres because if they do, if you are in an area like that, that typically does not have food plots or agricultural, then they'll smash a plot like that right down to the dirt. So then it's a matter of great volume might even be the right location for a fit for some of these right here. Does it make sense they're hitting it because that's all that's available and, and they want that. Meaning if your neighbor had something that's a little bit sweeter, a little bit more attractive, like sticking with just rape, turnip, radish, then the deer would be over there and then maybe hit the stuff over after dark or maybe later in the winter or something like that where it doesn't matter. So be very wary of mixes that have these. Again, we figured this out 15, 20 years ago that they don't like kale, canola. I've been on so many client properties. I've been going to client properties since 05. I diagnosed food plots for a living. And we figured this out a long time ago when you're seeing rotting greens of kale, canola, collard greens in the spring, that that was something obviously that should not have been planting. And I've even seen it five feet high. So some of this stuff can grow very high. And I've even seen it in Northern setting, especially in Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, where they haven't eaten it. I know there's an exception to the rule, but usually if there's an exception, it's because of high deer numbers, low ag and low food plot percentages in the area. And it's really all they have left to eat. And I don't want to plant something that they'll eat only because that's all they have left to eat. Number four, mixed with grains, cereal grains, like oats, wheat, rye, need to be planted about four to five weeks after brassica. Around here in southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin, southern Michigan, lower half of uh, Wisconsin, northern Pennsylvania, and then over into New York, that would be more early August planting of brassica target around 8-1. And then you get down to like Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, maybe even into West Virginia, Northern Kentucky. That would be more like August 10th, August 15th. And then you could even plant a little bit later when you get down in the deep South, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, maybe even over into Oklahoma, depending on when that frost date is. So you can move that planting from August 1st up North, all the way down to September 1st down South and somewhere in between. Bottom line is if you're planting Brassica on August 1st, that means that you should be planting your cereal grains the first week of September. So a big difference in timing. What happens if you plant them all together at too much of a rate, uh, like a lot, of, a lot of the mixes have, then the rye or wheat or oats shade out the brassica and brassica can't stand any competition at all. It's one thing if there's only 10 pounds in the mix, then you know probably no harm, no foul. But even then, a lot of time your cereal grains, unless it's, we use uh, light oats in some of our mixes early, like our August 1st planting, a very light amount. So it's basically about, um, let's say 15% of what a full acre would be. 
in the bag, so very small amount, but it's used more as a cover crop. Just something green that's gonna shoot up first. Deer like that lush green when it's first coming up, and you're just offering it as a cover crop. A little bit like they're using uh, oats around here for alfalfa in the spring. It's just that cover crop and nurse crop for that nice fall sweet blend that you're putting in. But if you're putting 50 pounds of rye or wheat in with, and I've even seen mixes that have rye, wheat, and oats, and then they'll have a pound or two per acre of brassica in the mix. And what that does is, it allows them to sell a smaller bag that covers more acreage because Dorf Essex Rape, for example, you only need five pounds per acre. So when you're putting two pounds in a cereal grain mix, you're accounting for four, ten four tenths, almost half of an acre, just with two pounds of that. So that means you can cut the overall bag size down and for shipping and volume that you should plant on a food plot, it'll look really good, but it's just shading out, crowding out that dwarf Essex rape or whatever other kind of brassica that they put in there. And uh, it's not really amounting to anything. So they fight each other. Really want to separate those out, especially if you're offering a volume. Now we, we uh, really promote, if your food plots are down or like our fall power greens, we want to add 150 pounds per acre of rye later in the planting season, five weeks later. And then after that, we're actually mowing or killing that out in the spring because you don't want to allow that rye or wheat to get three, four, or five feet high and take those nutrients out of the soil and take a long time to break, break down. Number five, Dorf Essex Rape. Like I mentioned, Dorf Essex Rape is a smaller brassica crop. It's a rape, very common, it's very cheap. So a lot of companies will add that to the mix just for a filler, just because it's very cheap to, the, to add 75 cents a pound, it's really low. So what that means is you can add it to the mix, they can lower their cost per half acre or acre down significantly and it improves profit margin and they sell it. Why do they call it dwarf? Because it's very small. It's not as big as a lot of the other, the opposite is the kale and canola, but they don't eat that. That gets four or five feet high and huge volume, big stems where the brassica is a lot smaller. It also self seeds a lot more and makes it through the winter time. So it can become problematic after a warm winter, especially when you're a little bit further south, may, maybe uh, southern Illinois, Indiana, and then further south, where it can actually reseed the following year. And if you don't kill it, and it turns into all those little yellow flowers and they turn to seed, then you have 100 times more seed than you need or 1,000 times more, and it just covers the plot in brassica. You kill it because there's such a seed bank in the soil. If you till it up, you just expose more seeds. And so it become very problematic. So that's why we choose not to have it in there. For one, it's a filler, it's low quality. Um, it's low cost, and so that's where you can start to see where uh, companies, if they can get these cheaper seeds and add it to the blend, they improve their profit margins, you don't know any better, and then you end up with low quality seed for it. So something we strive not to do at WHS Wildlife Blends, uh, check out our Big Boost Brassica blend along with the, all our other blends that we have. Uh, we sell buckwheat, uh, rye by the bag, more of a convenience for you. Um, and uh, we hope you like those seed blends and I hope that makes sense with this brassica. A lot of things to avoid. And as someone who owns a seed company, I get to choose and pick and choose with uh, basically 25 years of experience of planting brassica is what I want in the mix. And we change that every year. You're always chasing perfection. And, uh, but really in the end, whether you buy my product or someone else's, make sure you look on the bag and learn some of these things to avoid. Some of these things, if we wanted to, we would add them. If I thought it was a good thing with 25 years of experience of planting brassicas at a high level and instructing others to do so around the country times 1,400, then I'd add it to the mix. So if you don't see it in our mixes, it's probably not a good thing. But be very wary of some of these that are designed more to take your money out of your wallet than put bucks on the wall. Now, I don't know if you've checked out our main website lately, whitehabitatsolutions.com, but we've really had a lot going on, including hats, books, our web class, and certainly our new seed company, WHS Wildlife Blends. When you click on seed on our site, it'll take you right to our brand new site for the seed company. We have all 12 blends available. So check it all out though. I encourage you, I appreciate you checking it out. Whether you buy anything or not, Really appreciate you visiting the site and uh, seeing what's going on and continue to watch because we have big things coming later this year.